Hello, I'm Jorge Getoso. Welcome to a new program. On today's show, Latin America in Rebellion, our guest, Patricio Zamorano, co-director of the Council on Hemispheric Affairs. Patricio Zamorano, a warm welcome to the program. Thank you so much. Al always a pleasure. Patricio, Rafael Correa in Twitter has written, Alberto, Cristina, and Axel sweeps in the first round in Argentina. Daniel sweeps in Uruguay, but it's going to be a second round. Claudia Lopez wins the mayor in Bogota. The Chilean population is unstoppable. Very soon will return Ecuador and Brazil. What's going on in Latin America? Well, I would tell you that this is the outcome of the same policies that they have been uh, applying in the last decade. Very uh, neoliberal, uh, no focus on the actual needs of the population. They have destroyed all the, the progress that we had for so many years in terms of uh, a very progressive public policies. We have to remember that, for example, Macri, the first thing that, that he did uh, after taking power was to uh, eliminate all subsidies. He eliminated subsidies for, for uh, water services, electricity, gas, public buses. Mm -hmm. He destroyed the whole protection network that was created for uh, by so many years. And now we have 30 percent Argentinian population living under poverty. 50% of the children are, are actually poor in Argentina now. 15% are actually suffering hunger. So we have a huge, a huge uh, issue there. Uh, the, the, and the same situation in Ecuador. Lenin Moreno actually destroyed most of the policies implemented very successfully for, for so many years. Um, he actually forgave like a $4 billion to the big corporations that haven't paid any taxes for, for so many years, and, and he transferred that debt actually to the population of Ecuador, and he eliminates the subsidy to, uh, to gas. They call him traitor. Well, yes, because he's not actually following the public policy that actually helped him to take power in Ecuador. So we have a disconnection between these neoliberal presidents, between what the population actually need. They need minimal protection. And in Chile, it's exactly the same situation. Piñera, uh, he finds a solution to the issues of the country by increasing uh, the fare of, of, of the transportation system, uh, creating a huge explosion of, of unrest. So uh, they are totally disconnected from the actual needs of the population. There is no doubt about that. The other side of the coin, we're seeing in Bolivia, the re-election of Evo, exactly. and uh, the country of Latin America that is growing at a faster pace, mm -hmm. steadily for the last uh, 10 years, the best distribution of the income, exactly. yeah. a lot of progress in the social issues, and, uh, and means that an alternative government is possible. I mean, uh, I'm very glad that you're talking about Bolivia, because I think Bolivia actually represents a successful uh, story. You can have a market. You can have a very dynamic flow of capital. And Morales has been extremely successful. He has generated a whole new uh, wave of, of, of high income indigenous families. They are investing in, in, in new companies. They are creating innovation. They are really, really doing a very good job. But at the same time, it's a, it's a state that is very, very concerned about the needs of the, the poor. And also, uh, Morales, uh, you are totally right, the country has been growing, I think, like a 5% average every single year for the last 10 years. It's incredible. You can't do that. Why you cannot do that in Chile? Why you cannot do that in Argentina? Why you cannot do that in Ecuador? It's the opposite. What they are doing is they are applying again, again, the same recipe from the 90s, neoliberal policies with the pressure of the, of the International Monetary Fund, the, the, the IMF. That's a mistake. I think Bolivia is showing us a third wave, a third uh, way to actually do things right for most of the population, yeah. In the case of President Piñera, in 12 days, he went from Chile is an oasis to Chile is at war. What happened? This is very important. Thank you so much for the question, because people believe in this mirage that Chile is actually uh, almost a developed country, one of the best, uh, most stable countries in the world, an example of, of neoliberal policies and modern uh, uh, approach to uh, physical policies. That's an illusion. It's not real. 
70% of the Chilean workers make uh, less than $700 per month. 50% makes uh, less than $500. 1% of the population actually get 25% of the wealth of the country. 25% of the richest area of the country gets gets 50 percent of all the incomes so it's really is really extremely unfair and uh, more than that 50 percent of the poorest uh, population only get two percent of the wealth of uh, the country so and it's extremely unequal i just to tell you this chile is number seven in the whole planet uh, in terms an of disparity. Unequal, unequal country based on World Bank data. So it's, it's really unsustainable the fact that what, what Piñera was trying to do is he's totally disconnected from the reality of the actual people. President Piñera tried to put in place some uh, measures that are absolutely hitting the most vulnerable position of the population, part of the population. Population goes on the streets, uh, the largest um, demonstration in Chilean history, more than one million people in Santiago plus other cities, but the people demand structural reforms. Exactly. Are they going to get something? That's very problematic because we are asking a millionaire, the president of Chile, Sebastián Piñera, is, he's a millionaire and he's part of the big corporations of the country. So how he can implement uh, policies that are going to go against his own group of interest. So that's the big question. We need to, uh, in Chile, we have a very, very bad system where companies and big companies, they use certain legal privileges and sometimes they pay zero tax. Believe it or not, most of the companies in Chile, they can, they can get it easily. They, pay, they don't pay taxes. Uh, it's exactly the same situation in Ecuador when the government uh, eliminates any pressure against the, the financial system to pay back more than $4 billion. It's, it's unbelievable. Uh, so uh, in the Chilean case, if, we, if the government is not capable of implementing these actually necessary reforms, then we are going to have the same, the same social explosion in a couple of years, in five more years. The country will never develop. So we, we hope that the big corporations uh, of Chile are willing to collaborate with these necessary re reforms. We really need that as soon as possible. And also we saw on the street people just asking for that reforms and a repression that it hasn't been seen since the dictatorship of Pinochet. Yeah, I can tell you, I was, I was uh, raised during the dictatorship, and I can tell you that the, the images that we have seen in Chile, the military troops in the streets we, uh, implementing or enforcing curfew, and the fact that we have tanks in the street of Chile, that's extremely traumatic. We really thought that after three years of uh, democracy, we, we would never see that again, and we are seeing it. So it's, it's extremely traumatic for uh, the country. Military troops are not prepared to face uh, the population or to, or to perform uh, public actions, and, and it's exactly what the military young soldiers are actually doing. They're, they are not prepared for that, so they are using their weapons to kill people, to injure them. We are talking about more than, more than 20 deaths. Uh, hundreds of, of injured people, thousands of arrests. We have uh, uh, cases of torture, rape. Uh, the National Institute of Human Rights is documenting every single case. And let me tell you, the repression of this, of this last week has been incredible. I mean, we have seen videos uh, through social media and the images are disturbing. We, we, we cannot believe that our military is doing that to Chilean people. It's Chilean troops killing and torturing and repressing Chilean citizens. It's unbelievable. A Chilean, precisely a former president, we're talking about Michel Bachelet, that has been tortured during the dictatorship of Pinochet, was extremely tough on a report on human rights on the repression of Venezuela. We haven't heard about her in case of Ecuador that was as bad as in Chile. Now in Chile, could she be fair and objective and use the same type of rules to judge what's going on in Chile, what she did in Venezuela, or she has become part of the problem and not part of the solution? 
We have to see. We have to remember that Michelle Bachelet uh, was also a president of Chile, and she also uh, she supervised and implemented the same uh, economic uh, um, unfair system that created this this social explosion under Piñera. So we, that's a big question. How how Bachelet, who was part of the problem as well, how she's going to face this human rights situation in Chile? And you're right. The, the, there's a huge double standard. The uh, report that she prepared for the United Nations in, uh, on Venezuela was highly criticized. It was extremely partisan, very incomplete. She didn't even interview uh, like 100 percent of the, the victims, the people who were affected also by the opposition violence or, or to explain better in a constructive way the situation of human rights in Venezuela. Hopefully she learned from that experience. We need to see. We know that she called, she personally called President Piñera. Uh, in theory, she's, she's going to go to Chile soon. And we will see the situation of human rights based on the, on, on the curfew and the use of military troops in Chile is serious. It's very serious. And we will see what kind of consequences uh, Piñera is going to face because of that. When Ronald Reagan was a president, he was, as we know, you and I live here in Washington, they spin, they turn things around to make it look different to reality. He was spinning that the Contras were freedom fighters. In reality, they were guerrillas, and today, in days, we'll call it terrorists. They were trying to overthrow the presidency of Ortega. Now, many outlets in Chile and also in international media are trying to paint the picture that the people in the streets of Chile trying to ask for reforms and the stop of those measures that are really hit them very hardly are vandals. Are they? I can tell you that that's an, another thing. Uh, we have to remember that we have this legacy from the dictatorship. The, the health system was privatized. The educational system was privatized. Pensions were privatized. Uh, and now the, the other aspect is they are trying to criminalize the social expression of the people. In, in Chile, people are criminalized uh, when they do protests. The government uh, uses the, the police forces, the military forces now to repress the people and to pretend that they are criminals or any, or any other th theories that they are Cubans, that they are inspired by Venezuelans or the Russians is unbelievable. All those theories, the only thing that, that they do is to run away from the actual reality of the situation of, of, of most of the people in Chile. Uh, half of the workers in Chile are actually in huge debt. They cannot pay it back. Uh, we have a situation where uh, the salaries are, are extremely low. Uh, if you don't have money, you die in Chile if you get sick. You either use a, um, a state-based system that is extremely, extremely inefficient, uh, very slow and bureaucratic and bad quality, or you use the private system. In the private health system in Chile, if you don't have money, you have a very uh, low quality uh, health services. So uh, the, the, the problems are real. Uh, we have a population in Chile that, that, uh, who is desperate. Uh, even in terms of clinical uh, data, uh, believe it or not, 20% of the Chilean population suffer depression in Chile. Even among poor people, according to uh, academic studies, 25% of the poor in Chile suffers depression. Uh, so uh, we have a population that is being attacked by the government. Uh, uh, repressed by the government, repressed by the economic system, repressed by the big corporations with the extremely low salaries. So there's no surprise about the social explosion in Chile. To pretend that that's, the criminals that's created or, or by, by, by the Venezuelan, the Cubans, the Russians is just running away from reality. For example, in the case of Venezuela, there are reports that, that most definitely the United States are helping the opposition or that parallel government that they have created, and that's fine. But uh, they come with the story that uh, if uh, another country is putting their nose, supposedly, in Chile, it's uh, very wrong. 
Sure, sure. I mean, the, the double standard is to pretend that Piñera is not responsible, but these international groups, in the case of Maduro, he is responsible, not the U.S. influence. So it, it's just a double standard. It's just a political analysis of the situation. I will say less focus on the actual data. The social situation in Chile is horrible. Uh, it's not the, the one that you would expect from a country that in theory is modern and, and modernized. That's an illusion. It's not real. So we need to create reforms that are extremely strong tax reforms so the rich can actually tax. We have to uh, uh, create a public-based health system as soon as possible, public pensions for, for the all, all workers of Chile. We have to um, uh, uh, empower public education in Chile. We need to improve the salaries. All these things are real, are real things that we need to implement. It's not about ideology anymore. It doesn't matter if you're a right wing, a leftist, or, or an independent. We have to agree better distribution of wealth in Chile is, is mandatory to solve this crisis and to develop the country once and for all. The overwhelming protests of the people of Chile in the streets made President Piñera to put backwards their, their plans and he was uh, just leaving those measures without being implemented. Then he decided that he was going to renew his cabinet. At the beginning of this week, he said the curfew is off, uh, the, the waters are being calm, and I think that we go back to, to uh, quote-unquote normalcy. Do you think that uh, something is going to change? That's a very risky situation right now, Jorge, because uh, what we can see is that Piñera is trying to implement these, these minor reforms. He's trying to increase subsidies in cer certain areas, maybe trying to do something about salaries. Uh, those, those measurements are marginal. They really don't create a new structure of the unfair system in Chile. So we have to be extremely careful. I think if Piñera uh, he's really willing to do something, he could do it from inside. He belongs to the big corporations in Chile. He's himself a millionaire. We wish that he could actually be sensitive morally, morally to the situation uh, in Chile. If he's playing politics with the situation of the Chilean population, it's going to be very bad for the future of the country. We are going to have the same social unrest in a, in a few months. In a few years, it's going to be all over again. So we really need him to, to be serious about this. We, we, we have an opportunity here to reform the economic and financial system uh, of Chile to benefit most of the country, not just a very tiny elite. Could he resign or could he be deposed? No, according to the Chilean tradition and the Chilean law. We don't have that kind of thing in the Chilean history. I, I would say he was elected democratically. We need to respect that. The solution ha has to come from inside. Again, if he's willing to represent his own sector, the millionaires, the big corporations, and he's part of the solution, I think that would be ideal. Former President Correa, uh, in the Twitter that I was mentioning at the beginning, said the Chilean people continues unstoppable and this week there are again almost every day there are some uh, protests or uh, strikes or uh, yeah. activities going on against the government. President Piñera must be feeling the heat. Sure, sure. I mean uh, all these theories about the, the, the causes of the crisis being the Cubans, the Venezuelans, the Russians, whatever, uh, got totally destroyed last week when we have more than one million Chileans on the streets that affected Piñera, I would say, in a positive way, saying, oh, uh, I, have, I can see clearly that, uh, that these issues are real, and I have to respond to those issues. This whole movement has actually created a lot of energy. The unions are very, are very united now. Uh, uh, grassroots organizations, uh, the Chilean youth, artists, journalists, uh, activists, uh, I think this um, this process is real, in base, is, is actually based on legitimate reasons. So we will see. We will see uh, how, how the government is going to react. If, uh, we are sure that he cannot repress one million people. I mean, one million people on the streets is, is more like 5% of, of the population saying we are tired of this. So hopefully the political class in Chile, they listen to the people and uh, hopefully they are willing to implement the reforms that the whole population demands.
What do you think that could be the reaction of the U.S. here in Washington when they see Latin America in rebellion and they were trying to put everybody under neoliberal uh, policies? Well, we, the U.S. the U.S. is actually using the OAS, the Organization of American States, to be its weapon of penetration in the Latin The Ministry America. of the Colonies, as has been yeah, said. Exactly. The, I mean, it's incredible. Uh, the OAS. Uh, release this press release against the uh, situation in, in Ecuador, for example, saying again that uh, it was um, a, something created by, by the Cubans or the Venezuelans. They're not capable of recognizing the actual social situation uh, in the country. Or uh, we have also the, the fact that the U.S. is trying to convince that uh, in the Chilean case, uh, the Russians are actually it's just completely desperate. Or the Bolivian case, Evo Morales was re-elected again. The, uh, the elections were clean, transparent, but then... With their observation, with the observation of the and, OAS. And the OAS creates this press release describing the situation in a way that you could think that there was something wrong. It's unbelievable. They didn't do that with Honduras. In the Honduran case, the, the electoral mission of the OAS clearly, clearly found the proof of fraud. They, they even said that there was fraud. They still recognize the government of Juan Orlando Hernandez, who will know now that this is very close to, to narco dealers. The U.S. knows that, the U.S. know that, but they don't do anything. So again, double standard, morally, politically, they have a double standard that is unbelievable. It's very, it's very offensive. Patricia Zamorano, thanks very much for joining us. It's been a pleasure.